You can I was say just looking you. up. I was like, oh, no, I don't have his phone number and he's not here yet. What am I going to do? No problem. I'm here. Good. Um, just by way of introduction, we, for the folks on the phone here, I've not met Mark. I'm meeting him with you now. Um, I don't recall how I tripped across your profile, but I was like, I want to hear what this guy has to say. So thank you for having virtually no information about me or the group and agreeing to talk with our little medical device quorum here. No problem. Actually, we uh, we initially uh, had a random contact about a year ago where I was uh, I had reached out to you because of the group um, suggesting that we needed to put something militant together to uh, uh, you broke up there, but you broke up there. Militant that we, and then I lost you. Uh, to, to put together some efforts to um, help to protect small medical device companies that are not well enough funded to survive, but yet still have phenomenal contributions to make with their devices. You're talking John Eckberg language. John is a now semi-retired um, member of the Cook Medical family. And a decade ago, John uh, found me and introduced me to this concept called the medical device tax, and then got his CEO and everyone on board. And we put together a site called no2.3.com and generated, I think, 11,000 signatures to bring to Congress to help lobby efforts. John gives me great credit for that. That's why it all went away. And I'm like, okay, I think it was more than that. Um, but yes, I, I too am a friend of small medical device business. Sue is presently small, but uh, for the news that I saw her post recently on LinkedIn, that's just a temporary phenomenon. You wanna come off uh, mute there and tell my friend Mark about what you're working on? Hi, Mark, um, Joe, thank you for this opportunity. It's nice to meet you. Um, I am a pharmacist by trade and I saw a problem with the filtering of medication packaging glass samples. And the problem is that 100% of the time glass shards get into that ampule. So it's mandated that it needs to be filtered before it can be administered to the patient. The current solution is switching out needles using two needles and it's complicated and unsafe and could lead to needle stick injuries. So I've invented an all-in-one package, one needle filter called frog filter removal of glass. So it basically eliminates needle stick injuries because there's no switching of needles. It ensures that it's gonna be um, performed properly and it's, it's quicker in an emergency situations. Um, let's see if I've got one here handy. I actually saw a preview of your technology and thought it was amazing uh, when it, well, the, the initial um, uh, review of, of the technology came out. It's absolutely needed and, and brilliant, brilliant. Oh, thank you. Where where are you knew about it? How did you happen upon Sue's technology? Well, there's all sorts of things going on in the industry that uh, you get random random notices about various things being developed, and this was one of them. And uh, in particular, I, I remember very clearly talking about the the problem of glass shards being injected into people um, because there was no filtering, and um, it came to me also because there's some regulatory work. Uh, at the government level to make sure that, that this becomes standard of care. Um, it is standard of care, but it's not being performed. And, and uh, <clears throat> I don't want to get sick overseas. We just finished conducting AU studies and, and they don't wear gloves or practice aseptic techniques. So um, don't go to the hospital in Europe is my advice. <laughs> uh, well, let's start uh, a bit. A bit throughout the world. See, uh... As you can see, Mark, I, uh, I let Everyone come on, unless there's like slides or something then it gets a bit confusing, but I imagine we're just gonna talk. <clears throat> and this is just an open forum. Um, this is a conversation and my question couldn't be more open-ended this morning. So welcome Mark and please tell us what you do. So uh, I'm a f uh, I, I left medical practice about two years ago, uh, just before COVID, uh, only because I had been in practice for so very long, uh, 30 odd years and uh, the environment in practice was becoming more and more corporate. Um, you know, I'm not one of those people who likes the, you got 15 minutes. So uh, if you can't get it done in 15 minutes, make another appointment. That's just not, that's just not good quality care. 
Um, but at the same time, I, I, I'm a serial inventor. I've invented a number of things in the field of medicine, some of which I've given away for the public good. Um, but uh, currently what I'm doing is uh, we discovered um, with one of my inventions that we can diagnose endometriosis in a completely non-invasive way with an instant diagnosis at all levels of disease um, in the 30 minute test that is start, we're going to launch in uh, the next two or three months. That is 100% accurate with 100% specificity and selectivity. So we kind of stumbled into um, what Peter Heinlein, who's the director of uh, new innovations in the GYN division of Kaiser Permanente called the black box they've been waiting 50 years for. And it's going to revolutionize um, so much in the field of endometriosis, saving the lives and livelihoods of hundreds of millions of women worldwide. So it's a very exciting time. Mark, I'm a very visual person. Do you have a prototype or a website or anything we could look at? Oh, sure. So the website is uh, www.3cpm.com. Okay, let me call that up. And the name of the device is the Tricorder 3L. For those of you who are Trekkies, you'll recognize that name. And it's done because what we are doing is we are sensing the uh, myoelectrical energy given off when smooth muscle in the body contracts. And so I've been able to identify a very specific fingerprint and there's the device. It's actually quite simple um, and uh, built to military standards, non-invasive, it takes 45 minutes. And the whole test consists of three electrodes being placed on your abdomen and you drink a glass of water for five minutes and then rest comfortably in a reclining chair. So originally the device was created to uh, look at gastroparesis and dyspepsia, which is where it's been since 2000. But you know, one of the funny things is uh, if you open up the frequencies and look at higher frequencies, which no one was doing, there's amazing things that are happening inside your body that uh, create abnormalities that we can then detect. And so what's happening with this endometrial tissue is it, it, it puts out these neurotransmitter substances that then activate the bowel beyond its normal capacity. And that's what we are, um, that's what we sense. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to throw a couple of slides up if you'd like me to. Yeah, I'll, I'll be a little bit you, more specific. If you think it will help us tell this, understand, yeah, by all means, you're welcome to, this yeah. is your hour. Just, I don't know what oh, okay. she's talking about here. I thought maybe I'd get a sense. Uh, she's, just, she's just talking about how wonderful she is since she got diagnosed and nobody had figured out what was wrong with her before. Um, let me go ahead and get this queued up. and we can uh, take a brief look at some important slides. Okay. I don't want to go through an entire one hour presentation. I no, usually no, have. this is far less formal than that. No, While you're pulling be... that up, tell us a bit about your foundation. That's a thing that really caught my attention. Well, you know, along the way, I always felt that, um, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're fortunate enough to be born into the proper uterus to allow you to make a lot of money, <laughs> okay. um, you know, uh, you've got to give back. Um, you've got to give back. And so, um, I've always done a lot of work as a result of my, my educational endeavors. I have master's and uh, a doctorate degree in tropical medicine. And so I've always done a lot of work in the tropics, in particular Africa. And so um, we started a foundation to help the people in sub-Saharan Africa. Initially, it was designed so that it would be just medical. And we would help build new clinics, renovate, renovate clinics. And we, we quickly evolved into something that was far more into the educational side of things. And um, we, uh, uh, there's a thing called the Harmatan, which is the dry season in sub-Saharan Africa, where the, literally the sands of the Sahara Desert blow down across the lower half of Africa and nothing can grow during those times. And, um, unfortunately, what happens is all the crops dry up and die and there's not a lot of money available for people. And the first thing that they lose is the ability to go to school because school is paid for entirely out of the family's pocket. We don't have, they don't have public health systems that they can't, public school systems that pay all the money. So they've got to pay school fees. They've got to pay their books and their notebooks. And the harmatan, the dry season was so severe and it lasted for such a long time. Uh, they came to our foundation and they said, look, none of the kids are going to go to school this year. They're all going to get behind. Um, which explains why when you go there and you ask, how old are you? With, to kids who are still in like, let's say high school, you know, some of them are in their mid twenties. 
And it's not because they're dumb. The, uh, the Africans are extremely entrepreneurial and extremely bright. So um, they said, look, if, if you could help these two communities and pay the school fees, let's, um, you know, this would be great this year. And so, and I said, well, how much are we talking about? And they said, well, we've got about 3,500 kids. And, you know, for about $5,000, you can buy all their notebooks, all their school books and pay all their school fees. And I, I didn't hesitate for a moment because I'd worked with these communities for a number of years. We paid the fees. And so the real question is, is, is how do people repay you? You know, there's this concept in them. Um, in anthropology called gifting, right? So when you go to someone's house, for example, you're invited for dinner, you don't show up with a smile on your face and empty hands, right? You'll bring a bouquet of flowers for the hostess or you'll bring a nice bottle of wine. But when you show up with those things, you know, you're not going to bring a $5,000 bottle of wine to a potluck dinner because no one's gonna open the wine. No one will touch it because no one could ever repay you for the gift that's out of proportion. And so it's the same thing. So when you give something away in, 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 to an African community, they're going to find a way to pay you back. And so the way that they paid us back was 100% attendance. And for the first time, literally straight A's for every single member of the entire wow. school system. They were so motivated. The parents basically said, look, you know, you're getting this money. You're not, you're not, it's not costing us anything. We got to make sure that he's happy with the gift that we give back. And the gift was 100% attendance and, and almost perfect grades. And it's the first time in their existence that they were able to do this. So when they came back and they reported this, we said, well, let's do it another year and see if this is just a fluke. So we did it for another two years. We in increased it to five communities and it ended up being the exact same results. And all of a sudden kids are going to the university now who were never going before. And in the third year, um, in the French system of education, they have this thing called the baccalaureate which is a national test that everyone has to take when you pass um, out of high school, let's say before the university. And it's a very, very difficult comprehensive test. And they had never had anyone pass in their community. In that third year, not only did they have everyone pass, but they became the number one region in the entire country with the highest passing rate. So, I mean, it, it was unheard of. We then went through two years where we said, all right, let's actually see what this means. Because the whole goal, my goal is to be able to go to the World Bank and get about a $50 million grant and, and blow this into the entire country and surrounding countries. Is, uh, so we picked four communities that we were going to reimburse and, or pay for, and we picked four communities that were not going to get the money, and we compared them, and it's night and day. The communities that were not funded had about 50, 60% attendance because the kids had to work in the fields most of the time, and the communities that were paid for, the kids were full-time in school, and again, we're going on to, and, and the, the kind of salient effect that came out of that was when you educated the kids and they were very eager to learn. They began starting small industries in their own communities and not leaving for the big cities anymore. Hmm. So they, they started enterprise zones. They started an internet cafe. Uh, it was just amazing, the transformation. So, I mean, my ultimate goal when I get done doing all this other work would literally be to try and promulgate this throughout Africa, Southeast Asia. It's all the same concept based off of gifting. Remind because me, for which, literally, country, which country did you start in? Togo. In Togo, okay. Togo. Um, and it's just, um, it's just been remarkable, uh, remarkable. And again, it's all based off this, this sociological concept of gifting. So if you find the right gift, then you get the right reward. That's lovely. So, so uh, uh, any you wrote a comment, you wanna just... Uh, chirp in what you what you wrote yeah um well we want to give back and that's always been um i i admire you for for what you've done and we uh, we at cartech want to provide we're talking to one of the side arms of the bill gates foundation so that when we're up and running we want to provide filters to all the uh under well most of the underrepresented nations but africa is definitely i've got this kid that that links in with me that connected me from africa and i promised him that i would help him out so that's that's just my personal um, goal is to go over there and, and make a difference. So thank you for what you're doing. And um, if we can help in any way moving forward in the medical community, let me know. Yeah, no, that would be that would be wonderful uh, when that technology gets to Africa. Now, of course, you realize that uh, there's a very, very high chance that they're going to reuse the technology beyond what it's originally um, created for. So you might want to do some. Uh, internal studies on how many times it can be reused safely while okay. still continuing to function only it to be, able be used to... once there's no way to reuse it 
Ah, okay. All right. Well, then you won't have the, uh, then it can't get, it, it won't be reused. They're very, everyone's very ingenious in the world. Um, but this idea of giving is very, very important. So for instance, at 3CPM, when we introduce the, uh, the tricorder 3L technology for endometriosis, within three years, we will be a $200 million company. Um, I already have pre-orders for the device before it's released um, uh, to sell about 3,600 of them within the first two to three years. Um, the country, Australia has a gigantic endometriosis um, effort that they funded with $28 million and they are going to be putting hundreds of machines in all their clinics for screening. Um, that's how, how quickly this is, has caught on even before it's released. Uh, but I have pledged two things. One is um, very quickly, I want to be looking for a highly qualified female CEO to run the company. It is a woman's uh, disease. It should be run by a woman. And we're going to put a minimum of 10% of the profits into um, other uh, foundations that uh, assist with improving the lot of education in the world. Mark, I'm sure you're, you have an excellent team behind you. I'm compelled with my panel of experts to ask a question or two, Michelle. Um, if you would ask a, an intelligent question of uh, Mark about where he is regu regulatorily, and Paul, if you want to come on, I'm curious about how you're assembling your device, Mark. Maybe uh, Paul has an insight about supply chain that could be helpful, Michelle. Yeah. So when Joe pulled your uh, website up, I saw that you said that it's the only F, uh, approved test. Was this like a class three PMA for you to use that term? So we are a class two. Okay. According to Do the you FDA. have a 510K? Yeah. So, so since 2000, um, we've, we've, we received our, actually our FDA approval was in 1998. Okay. For the original um, so device. Just it, it, the, the correct term is uh, cleared for class two devices and the FDA reserves a, the term approved for class three. And then when you got your um, approval, or sorry, no, I'm on <laughs> your clearance in 98, uh, was it also, did it include those original, the gastroparesis, the other one, and the endometriosis, or did you go back and expand the endometriosis, the, the, well, the, the it, submission to include that indication? So um, as it turns out, you know, the device doesn't do anything different than the original device. So we are not detecting endometrial tissue. We are detecting the effect of endometrial tissue on the gastrointestinal system. So the original device is approved to detect the myoelectrical activity of the uh, gastrointestinal in the gastrointestinal system. Um, that had been expanded out to include other smooth muscle intra-abdominal organs. So we went back to the FDA and they said, you do not need any additional clearance. You are fine the way you awesome. are because fundamentally your device is not doing anything different other than being able to point out that uh, you have discovered that endometrial tissue has an effect on the system you're, you're using it for. So as far as, uh, you know, we would be classed, I guess, as a pre-market startup, believe it or not. Um, all that, that heavy lifting has been done um, under my guidance over the past few years. Uh, we're seat marked and MDR will be, will change from MDD to MDR sometime later this year when we get our appointment date. Uh, ISO up to date, um, and as well as MDSAP. So um, from a regulatory point of view, even though it's the, a colossal pain in the ass, um, but a necessary one in some ways, um, we are um, already done when it comes to that. No, that, that's great, especially to, to be one of the few tackling MDR right now. Most people are just throwing their hands up in the air and walking away. Well, they kind of have no choice because you know the, the EU was not prepared, right? They they enacted all these new rules and regulations. They said that everybody now has to register with something called Udemed, but Udemed doesn't really even exist yet in a functional capacity. So, you know, Udemed would be the equivalent of the MOD, FDA MOD database. Um, but when they did this, they had no notified bodies who were prepared to actually convert people into MDR. Now there are seven and those seven are overwhelmed. And you can imagine the bigs have essentially taken up all those slots. So Medtronic mm -hmm. just comes in and buys up all the slots. So again, there's that disadvantage to the small medical device manufacturer. We're standing in line picking up the, the dregs of what's left behind for us because the industry that has the money actually uh, is able to dominate even the regulatory approval process. I call them the one percenters. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great term. It is the one percenters, although 
we have one of those one percenters nipping around our heels wondering when they can try and come in and buy us, but uh, we'll see what happens with that. Paul, do you have some questions or comments about his supply chain approach? Uh, the first comment is just, man, congratulations. I love what you're doing. Love the whole concept of giving and, uh, and what you're doing in uh, Tonga and uh, Togo and uh, in Africa. Uh, and Joe, great question. I mean, you know, personal connection, right? I mean, that's you talk about your why and what you're driven for. Forget about it. I love what you're doing. So congrats on that. <clears throat> we have a, by the way, I just reached out to you on LinkedIn as well. Uh, I'm here in this group because we are a uh, FDA registered logistics company, but more importantly, a contract manufacturer in the Silicon Valley. And now we're expanding we're in the midst of an m and deal. I'm driving that as well to other locations in the U.S., been around for a long time. So my question is, at what stage of development are you? Uh, are you ready to look at, are you looking at distribution? Are you looking at, uh, you know, product assembly? Because one of the things with all the challenges in the supply chain world, what we're noticing now is that it may, it's time to revisit how people are putting product together because it's so costly to put a complete box together in China, hypothetically, or Taiwan, anywhere in the world, and bring that entire big box right, to the U.S., would it be, and a lot of people are finding it's easier to bring the components in trays so you can fit much more in, in a case or much more in a container, keep those costs down, and then assemble them in the U.S. and protect IP. We're having those conversations. Or even taking it, if the scale is larger, putting a project together with Mexico in NAFTA, with the, with the NAFTA, uh, the new NAFTA USMCA protections around IP. So my point is, are you all at that level where you're already producing the product, or where you're in the development scale? And if I can help rethink supply chains, which is what I'm, I find myself doing these days, uh, we've got some solutions and that's my focus area. Thank you. I, I really, really appreciate that. And I would love to have some further discussions with you. We've been manufacturing the device since 2000. Oh. Um, our demand has not been high. We are about to go from a demand of 20, 30 units a year uh, which we sell at 38,000 a unit uh, to, to probably 1,000 to 2,000 units a year. And uh, about a year ago, one of the things I did looking at supply chain issues is I went and uh, we updated all of the electrical components on the board and I bought 1,000 boards worth of components mm. to sit on a shelf, knowing that there would be a short supply coming at some point. Um, it's a very simple unit. It's a small board that's built into a commonly available um, off the shelf uh, uh, plastic package. Sure. And where, so, uh, where, where are those with, boards physically? Are they in Maryland with you? Yes. Ones that, well, some are in Maryland, some are in Washington. And uh, Washington the, uh, so, what I do when I'm not doing this is I'm a marketing strategist and I'm compelled to ask, how are you going from selling 20, 30 units to 1,000? What is that catalyst that's going to really kickstart this thing? Um, well, we've been we've been talking to key opinion leaders and and governments around the world, and they are literally standing in the wings with orders. Now, of course, we have a sales staff that we will put we will do boots on the grounds in the U.S. and we will use highly motivated and proven distributors globally who can take a product like this, who have the infrastructure to do that. And we've been pretty successful in finding them. Our uh, I will step out of the CEO role and up into the chairmanship role exclusively. And uh, the person who will step into this role is a, a friend of mine who's been on our board for a long time. We've worked together for 30 years. His name is Carlos Babini, and he has extensive experience running medical device companies and ramping them up from literally nothing and then selling them for hundreds of millions of dollars. His most recent was uh, with SurgiQuest that got sold to uh, ConMed for 158 million. And so um, he will step into that role because he has the skill sets that are important um, to, to make all of that happen. Um, I am going to continue uh, in, in, in development. Uh, product still needs to be developed for the future. You know, we're talking about devices now that will go into physicians' offices, clinics, hospitals, ambulatory surgery centers, but you know, there's a bottleneck there. And I accounted for that bottleneck about five years ago uh, when I developed the next level of the product, which is actually a home-based device. The bottleneck in a clinic is if the test takes 45 minutes, it means you have to go with, with room turnover. You can't do more than eight a day with every machine that you have. And if so I may, if I, I may ask Michelle, uh, when he goes into home use, is there a regulatory implication? Gigantic. <laughs> you yeah. are gigantic. Go ahead, Michelle. 
Yeah, that uh, that could uh, be considered a change of an indication with the FDA. Um, and then in, even in terms of the product design, there are different types of electrical safety standards and usability standards um, that will apply. So um, there's a possibility that that to go into the home use, the design may or may not um, meet the clearances required for um, for a piece of electrical equipment. Let me ask Rick Stockton to come off mute. And I think of design for mature manufacturability. I think of you. Did you hear anything in there that's uh, uh, an alert? Uh, no. In terms of in terms of needs, if you've already if you've already designed it to military standards and it's already gone through. Um, um, an amazing amount of design filters. So it sounds like the it sounds like unless you have new things, your design for manufacturability is probably good from a performance aspect. And the only thing that the only thing that you that would be a concern and that's going on in the future is just trying to get just trying to make sure costs stay where they need to be. Because of course, as soon as someone figures out, uh, as soon as the numbers grow high enough, somebody will want to figure out a patent or somebody will want to acquire the technology. And they want to know. Uh, they want to know. Streamlined it can get, but man, I'm just impressed. This you should definitely calling it a tricorder. Um, <laughs> I love it. I is love there, it. I have to ask: Is there? Are you allowed to use that term? And you might be familiar with the X Prize and the tricorder thing. I, I know the term's been out there in medical device. So we are allowed to use it, and that's why we call it the tricorder 3L. If I were to just call it tricorder alone. Uh, there is a little caveat to that, and that is that I actually hold the patent for the tricorder. So I think I'm pretty much protected on that. Okay. I, uh, a number of years ago, <laughs> I, uh, I, I actually designed the device that they used on Star Trek, um, th that they conceptually used in Star Trek. I actually patented that, that process. And so um, I'm not too worried about it, but you're right, from a, uh, a PTO point of view, um, I can't use the name tricorder, but as long as I call it tricorder 3L, I don't have any issues. Now you may have answered this and I may not have grasped it. I'm still not sure what's going to make your sales 20, 30, 50 X versus what you have been doing. What, what, is, what is the big change right now? The big change, well, the, the, the first thing I think is that, is that uh, I'm not selling something I have to convince someone to buy. Right, people, but that's also people, true today, so. No, no. Uh, it, with the current device for gastroparesis and for uh, for uh, dyspepsia, I, I have to convince physicians that it would be useful for them to use it. Um, it's it's a it's a very hard sell uh, because they have other ways they make their money that um, don't involve them having to think. Uh, as far as this new device, this is the device the market's been waiting for. This is a multi-billion annual marketplace with no competition. That, that this device has stumbled into. And so, um, you know, I, I've, I've got sales already to the Cleveland Clinic in advance. They've already bought up units before I've even put them on the market. Um, that's how strong the demand is. Is it that the market is becoming aware of this? Because again, forgive me if I missed it, the product that you presently have is the product you're going to have, or, or do you have some design or some upgrade or something that's making it not what it is today? Uh, that's what I'm trying to figure out. So the, it's the indication and the change in the software programming that makes this device able to detect the fingerprint of endometriosis. I see. And so, presently, up until now, it has not had that capability. Uh, no, no. Until I opened the software filters up to 200 cycles per minute. Before that, for the stomach and the intestine, we really try and filter everything above 15 cycles per minute. But once I realized what endometriosis was doing and that we needed to see up to 200 cycles per minute, then everything changed and there's amazing electrical frequencies going on inside your body that account for health and for disease. You know, this area of, of, of tracking electrical energy, you know, there, there's this thing called homeostasis, which is your body is looking for certain signals to generate the constant repair that has to take place every day. You're breaking down every day. We are all breaking down every day. And as long as the body is receiving the healthy signal, so between, let's say, the, the gut and the brain, there's a particular place in the brain that interfaces with the gut through the vagus nerve. And it's looking for this signal called three cycles per minute, name of the company, actually, three cycles per minute. And as long as the brain is seeing three cycles per minute and electrical energy coming up out of the abdomen, it knows the body is healthy. And when it doesn't see that, then bodily processes start to deteriorate. And there are a number of devices out there already that are doing this. 
For instance, if you have osteoarthritis of your knee, your knee normally, when it contracts, gives off 7.5 cycles per minute of energy. And as long as it does that, the natural reparative processes go on. But the moment you have an injury and can no longer flex and extend your knee normally, you're not generating 7.5 cycles per minute of energy, and there's no reparative process that takes place. So there's a company that created this bio bionic knee device that pumps in 7.5 cycles per minute of energy overnight while you wear it. They've been around since 1985. It's not being used because their competition is money handed to the surgeons to replace knees. And, um, but it will, within a year, replace your cartilage back to normal. It will, within two or three months, make you pain-free and not have you require a knee replacement. So this technology exists. It's, it's recognized. It's just not used because the profits are going to people who's interested in replacing knees, not in improving patients' lives. But you know, the, the biggest recognition of this, aside from that device, is if you look what happened in sports medicine in the past 20 years, right? If an injury, a knee injury, it would usually right, ice, immobilize, and then stay rested for three or four weeks and then rehabilitate. They don't do that anymore. You hurt your knee, you're back on the field the next day because they recognize if your knee is not moving, going through that range of motion, it's not repairing and you're going to take months and months and months to heal as opposed to a couple of days. So we are sensing a, these. Did you have a few slides that you wanted to share? Not necessary, we're on a roll, but if there's something that you think will help us understand, I'm happy to give you the screen. Yeah, let me just, uh, let me just pull one of those up. But with regard, I just want to touch back on the regulatory side. The regulatory world for a at-home test is a completely different monster. And we've been working on that and our designs are actually um, compatible with what we need to do, not only for the FDA, but the EU is even worse. How many employees do you have? Three. Okay. Three employees, which is about to grow. Um, we're in the middle of a capital raise. We're, we're raising 7 million for 20% of the company right now. And that's going to enable us to put the boots on the ground and, and hire the appropriate people that we need. Um, I've, I've already reserved, as I said, I've got a thousand boards already built and ready to go out. Our bottleneck, by the way, is not production. Putting the units together, they can, they can do a hundred of those an hour, but it's the integration with the software and the verification and validation process that takes almost two hours, that needs to get automated because that's our bottleneck is we, it has to go through extensive testing where we pipe in the same signals and we have to see within a 0 0.03 variance, the same thing being detected by the device. Now we might not have that person on the call right now, but I'll open anyone to comment. This is a main challenge for him. Are any of you yes. working on or aware of a way to help him automate that validation if i could comment uh, i mean yeah we've uh, we've Introduce built yourself sir yeah, okay i'm andre domino from adm tronics mark very interested in what you presented uh, the uh i mean we've worked on a number of fixtures that have automated processes with with routines that are put through and we typically do that just as you say to automate specifically uh functions of a embedded software that might be implanted uh, might be embedded within a, a microprocessor and then to test out the various functions of that microprocessor on an automated basis. And then maintaining all of that in the database so you could refer back to that serial number unit and you know prove out that each one of those tests have been performed and captured in the system. That's exactly where we're going to have to get moving towards uh, because there is, a certain, there is a certain process that we have to go through in this verification validation and it becomes essential. As it is now, every unit is hand-built and hand-tested before it goes out the door, which perhaps maybe accounts for why with three or 400 units in the field, we have no customer complaints in any given year, other than sometimes where is the on button? That's the one that we might get from time to time from someone who has never used the system. Um, so you know, that's one of the most important things for us that I was trying to design in, in terms of quality is make it so it worked the first time, every time, again, getting back to military grade, Got to fall off a shelf, 20 foot off a concrete floor and work the first time you plug it in. And, uh, and it does, I've tested that myself. I'm gonna and go I ahead and help with that last item. I would just suggest as a marketer, get a big button that says on and make it red. <laughs> yeah, get one that of those great. staples buttons, right? One of the staples buttons. <laughs> let me, uh, so uh, let me give you a little preview of what we have. Uh, I've got to share my screen. Give me one second. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Are you able to see that? Yes, we can. 
Okay, so this is the device. This is what you do now for the diagnosis of endometriosis. And this is why we are growing so quickly without even trying, is that right now for you to have a diagnosis, you've got to go through five holes in your abdomen and about a one hour piece of surgery. Uh, and that's how they make the definitive diagnosis. This is very discouraging, not only because you have to have it done, but think about post-treatment vigilance. They can't develop medical treatments for this disease because you can't tell that they're better unless you go back and do surgery. No one volunteers to have three surgeries done to test a drug. Hmm. So that's where the field is stuck. Now you're talking about three electrodes on the abdominal wall, uh, a belt worn across the chest. And, and that's the entire system that then connects to a computer. This is the main unit in the device. This, when I first joined this company as a user in 2000 was the size of a bread box. I think everyone here is young enough to remember what a bread box is. And that's literally how big it was. And it had 30 dials that were adjustable on the front. And that's like 30 dials too many for any doctor to be able to have access to. So my background um, before I got into this particular device is as I was starting my practice, have any of you seen any medical simulators out there? They have simulators to teach you uh, uh, cardiac life support, advanced life support, uh, uh, laparoscopic surgery. So I had a company in Seattle called Ixion. And we're the ones who invented all of that technology back in the 1980s. And so I took my software programming ability. I developed AI for that system before anyone called it AI, as well as then our hardware integration stuff. And I applied it to this. And so we went from bread box to the size of two iPhones stacked on top of each other. And, and so this is the technology as it sits today. Uh, it's delivered in the US on a cart which is shipped and, and actually integrated independent of what we have to do for a charge. And of course, the most important thing is there's a consumable. So this is a unique consumable. Those of you who may have had the disfortune of having to have testing done where they put these gel pads on your abdomen or your chest to look at your heart. Um, these are dry gel pads. I uh, changed the technology uh, so that we could have a very wide area of, this, of detection. So I can literally detect the entire abdominal cavities worth of uh, electrical energy and there's no artifact because they are dry gel these are single packs and provide substantial revenue stream because it's one time use only what we pick up though here's the fingerprint i'm talking about if you have endometriosis this is a unique signal that occurs between the frequencies of 15 and 20 as well as 30 40 and 50 and 60. no one else no, no, there's no other disease in your body that does this. And we know this because we've tested this on over 3000 population healthy normals. And these signals don't exist in those patients. We've also tested it in people who did not have endometriosis, who just complained of abdominal pain, and they don't have this signal either. So this is a very unique signal to endometriosis. And if you wanna compare it to normal, here's the endometriosis patient, and here's what normal looks like. And you can see it's, it's remarkably different. And now, if I could, the is this free, like the with your uh, the 15 to 20 uh cycle that that peak is that the size of that peak is that definitive of the progression of the disease you know i'm glad that you asked that question so you know the mechanism of action is um the endometrial tissue secretes substances that we call neurotransmitters and these neurotransmitters uncouple remember that word homeostasis they uncouple the body's normal homeostasis in other words the body tends to not let the gut contract more than one to 15 cycles per minute. When you uncouple that, and that's what these neurotransmitters do, then the, it's like an epileptic fit that takes place of your gut. And so that's why these frequency peaks are so much higher because they don't exist normally. And, and, and these are uncontrolled. Now, like anything that secretes a substance that acts on a tissue, everything is dose related. The more endometrial tissue, the more extensive the disease, the higher the peaks, the higher you sense the, the values to be. The less tissue you have, or let's say you're taking hormones to try and suppress the endometrial tissue, then your values are much lower, which is why we don't, we, while we show these images as part of the software package, we do not rely upon anyone's ability to recognize a pattern. Instead, I decided, no, that's not the way, you can't do this, right? Because a surgeon will look at this and, and they'll look at you like you're crazy because they just want to know, or not. You got to give them a number. And so I wrote the AI. We took, a, we took area under the curve and used a linear regression analysis and wrote the AI 
reactive based AI. Look at these values and step through to say who has the disease and who doesn't have the disease. And we just give them a threshold number. And if you're above a threshold of five in our particular case, then you're going to end up with a diagnosis of endometriosis. To give you an idea of these numbers, so here's a, an endometriosis patient, here's a normal patient, and you can see just with the naked eye, the endometriosis patient numbers in these frequencies are quantum numbers, quantum quantum values higher. This is, right. this is a no brainer really when you see this, right. and it is so unique. So from a treatment standpoint, because this, you're sort of taking me back 19, 20 years when I was CEO of a company that made spectrophotometers in Athens, yeah. Georgia. And I was- Very close, very you close. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at all the similarities because I would ask this question about how are you going to use this and then what? Because, you know, I was trying to do the upsell and I'm a sales guy, right? So, 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 so you know, initially we were just hoping to say we have a good diagnostic tool. But now, now, now ready? When we apply the AI, in a two-step formula. We yeah. go from just making a diagnosis to having 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. I now have a screening tool. Now, what does that mean in terms of the business? So in any given year, there's 178 million women in the, in the world who have this disease, who you could do the diagnostic testing on. But when you expand this into screening, so, so what Australia is doing is they're gonna put this into every pedi and then they're gonna do it in the US too. Every pediatric clinic, Every, every primary care office, as soon as a woman becomes of childbearing age, they start having their periods, right? They'll get tested and they're gonna know who immediately has the disposition to have endometriosis and then they can decide on treatment. So maybe they begin with early hormonal suppression, but there'll be many more drug treatments developed because this test will allow them to do painless, very inexpensive, non-invasive, post-treatment vigilance testing. Yeah. So the pharmaceutical- We're, we're opening a whole new way of diagnosis. It's, it's a genre. Oh, yeah. This is a genre. Oh, no, this, this is not about endometriosis because if you can start identifying these different patterns, you can keep adjusting that. Bingo. So in the future, my final invention, which, which I, I haven't put out yet, you will sleep in a bed that will diagnose what's wrong with you based upon the frequencies your body's giving out while you're asleep. And then it will turn, reverse the polarity and put the- energy back in to heal you while you're sleeping. Yep. That's the future. Yeah, you know, That's three years ago, I helped these guys go from 125,000 to 150,000 custom big box and help them build the boards to a small, you know, we were selling them for $20,000, $20,000, $20,000. And for spectro spectrophotometry to NIH and universities all over the world, 27 countries. And I was driving that. So I, I man, this, you know, I see the pattern. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> That's a Mark, to do. We, we're just meeting for the first time. The folks on the call will appreciate how much I love when a connection like this is made. And Paul, if you can keep it to 30 seconds, tell them about your spiritual journey. That's 30 unfair. seconds. That's unfair. <laughs> no, but it just but based no, no, on what you shared about the foundation, thing. I think you'll find it very meaningful. Yeah. So you know, I did everything backwards. I I spent uh, two years as a mystic, uh, from being homeless on and on the beaches and meditating and healing the world. I have the gift of healing. Traveled the world: Brazil, Brazil, Argentina, Spain, Luxembourg, Japan. Met my wife teaching meditation in Japan, uh, and now I'm creating. Then I came back to the business world because I realized everything is perfect the way it is. I didn't have to fix anything, but I always wait for the question. And the teacher exists only when the student appears with the right question. And the teacher then teaches only to the degree the question exists, right? Everything else is ego. And right now, when the pandemic hit, I moved from downtown San Jose to a 327 acre ranch. I live on the Navajo Nation. It's a checkerboard surrounded by the Navajo Nation. And I rescue wild Mustang horses uh, between Zoom calls. But the website is thehealingranch.org. I'm creating a space to help business executives work on themselves first and then their business. Mark me, no, Paul. I, Paul, I, Mark. I, I, cannot, I cannot tell you how important that is. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I gave a, um, I gave a presentation um, to a group of people who were interested in invest, and, and they were just wild about this. And um, I just remember... Uh, at the end, you know, I, they said, well, we think this is going to be a wonderful investment. And I said, you know, you can make money a lot of different ways, but the idea that you're going to be saving hundreds of millions of women's lives and livelihoods, that's what should be touching your heart, not how much money you're going to make. 
Exactly. And, and they said, you know, you must be a marketer. You must not be a marketer. You're not a CEO. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? The price just tripled for you. Exactly. In fact, not only <laughs> I, that, but why don't you just get the hell out of here? Because I don't I was want gonna, your money. I was going to lead with that. There's the door. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what I said. And these people were just like, what? What? You're never going to get anywhere. I said, oh, don't worry, honey. We're going to go big places. Yeah. But we're going to go places with people who have the heart to understand. Yeah. You're going to make money no matter what. Right. You're going to what I always tell people is that piss me off is I said, look, you came into this world naked and penniless and you're leaving the same way. And the ease with which you live life depends upon how much you piss me off in between intervals of naked and penniless. Wow. <laughs> this guy needs to hang out with us more often. I don't know what you're doing 52 weeks from now, but you have to come to our next event. Oh, All my right. God. Giving you a year's notice. <laughs> nice. Awesome. No, but Congratulations. it's important, right? It's important. Oh, totally. this oh, is, I it's, have it's, zero. It's, as I get older, I'm I'm becoming less tolerant. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not about tolerance. It's about, you know, when you die and you close your eyes, I always tell my staff, when I, when I close my eyes for the last time, on my last day on this earth, before I'm reborn, you know, what can I look back and say I did good? And this is just, you know, to, if, if I die tomorrow, leaving this technology behind, I, I can die with a big smile and very happy. Yeah, awesome. I don't sleep at night. I don't sleep at night because this is so exciting. And what we can do for people in the world is so exciting. And that's why, like I said, let's put, put organizations together who are similarly minded and we can do amazing things um, and, and put the one percenters to shame. Awesome. Awesome. Look forward to chatting, chatting with you. We have a lot of things to talk about. Oh, absolutely. You both emails. Absolutely. Maybe we'll just move everything to your ranch. Please. And, just, and manufacture. Mi casa, mi casa su casa. Vamanos. Let's do this. I'm loving it. I'm loving do you it. you have 300 acres to spare? Yes, 300 You can live comfortably on 27 acres? Uh, I don't need more than an acre or two. So. I'm talking to Paul. He's still living <laughs> 327 acres. I can't even fathom how big that is. I grew up in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, so I don't know what an acre well, is. It's, it's a half mile by one mile. Okay, if I can think in square blocks, yes, I have a chance. Okay, I'll figure that out as any of you. Thanks. <laughs> My driveway is a half mile. <laughs> Mark, I know there's far, far more we can cover, but I don't know of a better ending point than than this kind of spirit and what you shared. And I'm so grateful that on a flyer you came and met us today and that you've just committed 52 weeks from now to come out and meet us in person so um i will share uh i will have this recording on youtube for posterity and uh, i'll share your contact information with those gathered here today and surely you'll be getting in touch with paul maybe even hanging out on a mustang you can get him a free no, no, that'd be great. Right, paul? please uh, and any of you please feel free to contact Absolutely. me and, and let's continue our discussions thank you yeah. so much guys next week uh, of course is our event in san diego for those who will be and uh, for those who won't show up a week from today, when we'll talk about the event, what you missed, what was great, what, uh, you know, what improvements we can make for next year. So until then, Mark, thank you very much. I'm also spread the word, spread universe. the word, endometriosis, spread the word. We'll do that. Thank what, you. What do you want to, but specifically, Mark, what do you want us to uh, spread the link to your website? We're all yeah, about I that. would say, uh, I would say link to the website and there'll be more and more news coming out. Um, you know, again, we're playing it very close to the chest just yet. Do um, you have a, a trending hashtag that you want to go out there, like hashtag 3CPM? No, I don't. We're very unsophisticated so far in that level. We're, we might have to upgrade your website a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you're going to have to help us out. Yeah, right. Joe, 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 Joe is a genius. Go on. No, no, go on. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, he's only a genius. There's a lot of other stuff that's just a little rough oh, okay, around the okay. edges. But... This is where we call <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Take, Take care. care. Bye bye. Bye bye.